Good day, Thomas Jefferson, our podcast listeners. As always, I must say thank you so much for listening. We appreciate your time. This week, I, I just love these shows so much. We, we have Joe Ellis back on, and, and to listen to the two of you back and forth is just a joy. And, and this, this week's show was no exception. Well, you know, he and I have been friends since 1996, but now we're friends. You know, this has been one of the great things that's happened in my life that I could never have anticipated that so eminent a scholar and historian, a man who's won all of the awards, um, would give us the amount of time that Joe Ellis has given us over the past 18 months. Uh, this is partly uh, the result of the pandemic, and it's enabled the three of us, uh, you and he, he and I, and the three of us together to form a friendship which I think people listening can hear. There's a playfulness, there's a conversational tone to it. We disagree, but always in good fun. Um, and we're talking about having one of the great historians of our time giving uh, a fair amount of his own time and and debriefing himself after a career of just extraordinary achievement. And I feel blessed, and I think that this is um, a unique gift that we can offer the listeners to the Thomas Jefferson Hour. A lot of this week's conversation centered on uh, responses to the show Second or Fourth, which was our annual Fourth of July show, and the two of you answered a lot of listener email about that. And you also talked a fair amount about John Adams, and then we touched on the HBO miniseries, John Adams, which we all agree was fabulous. We didn't say this in the program, but as far as I'm concerned, Paul Giamatti is John Adams, and John Adams is Paul Giamatti. That is an inspired characterization, and I will never think of John Adams without looking at Paul's um, neurotic, anxiety-ridden, uh, face. Um, he does. He nails it. Uh, this is really a, a, a masterful portrayal of the great John Adams. And you know, I'm just very fascinated by the nature of, of this friendship. So, in my opinion, David Adams was right, but not always nice um, in the correspondence. Jefferson was always nice, but not always right. And that combination really produced wonderful exchanges between these two aging patriarchs. And you can just sense that neither one of them was willing to um, jeopardize the renewal of a friendship which which was central to the happiness of both of them. And eventually, even Mrs. Adams uh, entered into the equation, although Jefferson had made her non-participation a condition of renewing the correspondence with John. In, in a miniseries, like a fictionalized account of historical events, you know that there's going to be some give and take with, with the actual facts. But as Joe, or maybe it was you, said in the show, a great deal, I think it was like two-thirds of the dialogue was taken from actual correspondence. David McCullough was the author of the book behind it, uh, his biography of John Adams, which is an extremely good read, and I highly recommend it to anybody who wants to know that. The only better book, I think, um, but it's a shorter book, is Joe Ellis's book, Passionate Sage. But the, together they form a uh, really almost a perfect introduction uh, and comprehensive one, too, to the character and the soul of of John Adams. And so, yes, the uh, it, was, it was Joe who said it, but a, a fair percentage of the actual dialogue in the script for the miniseries came from the correspondence between these two men, which dated from 1776. And then there was an interregnum between 1800 and 1812 when they did not write to each other um, 1801, actually, in 1812. And then in 1812, the famous correspondence got started. I really enjoyed how much time they gave to the character of Abigail Adams. She was a very significant part of John Adams' public persona that, you know, he knew his own weaknesses and vanities more than any other human being of his time. And he realized that she was the, the steadying and the calming force in his life. And so that would not be true of Jefferson and his wife. And it's not even true of George Washington and his, or James Madison and his, that Abigail Adams is so central to the life uh, and the heart and the success of John Adams that they cannot be separated, whereas any of the other founding fathers can be seen if you wish to. Well, there is Dolly Madison. Well, Dolly, Dolly, of course, became a, a famous, famous social um, hostess and, and social arbiter in Washington, and but she didn't. She never attempted to tell 
uh, James Madison about political theory or politics. She was more like, I'll be the center of attention and people will just love our hospitality and they will love my outsized personality. We also answered a letter from our new friend in England, Ryan Baxter, and you made a threat to try and track him down when you're in England. I'm going to England in in, in late October to see my beloved child at Oxford and we're going to travel the country somewhat. Uh, and Bath is so important because my daughter and I uh, share many, many, many literary interests, and one of them is Jane Austen. And and you can't be a Jane Austen lover without Bath. Uh, and and for me, the, the the Roman baths. That's why Bath got its name. But the Roman baths in Bath are really extraordinary. The last time I was with my daughter, we went to the uh, to Hadrian's Wall up in the north of England, and I've been to another a number of other uh, Roman sites uh, on the island. But uh, but the baths at Bath are uh, spectacular and you get a sense of of how this you know even back then in, in the age of, of uh, Julius Caesar and Hadrian uh, the the Romans needed these um, these these mineral baths they found this natural spa site and it's been a spa site ever since and during the 18th century it, it, it achieved its apotheosis and all you have to do is read a history of bath during that time to get a sense of of the British at their at the height of of the Augustan age of the at the height of the Enlightenment. You've given me a perfect segue. You're talking about traveling, so I can ask you about traveling. Now, actually, when this show broadcasts, you will most likely be at the bottom of a river in Montana, right? Yes, I'm afraid that might be my fate. Um, I'm going out for my annual trip on the Lewis and Clark Trail. I look forward to it every year, um, and I will, of course, this year too. Uh, it's a hot summer, so I think the river will be very, very refreshing. And then we go up on the Lolo Trail and the Nez Perce Trail. And it's, this is the trip of trips. This is my favorite cultural uh, excursion. I do it every year. I'm going to do it until I can't climb the Wendover March any longer. And so I'm thrilled. And then the week after that, I'm taking a group down the, uh, the River of No Return, the Salmon River that Lewis and Clark hoped to navigate to the Pacific. They found that it was impossible, but we can do it thanks to um, extraordinary uh, um, outfitters, Wayne Fairchild's uh, outfitting group in, in Missoula, Montana, and also the high quality rafts that are now available. So that's uh, not the first time I've done that, but the first time I've done it in 20 years. And then of course, in, in the spring, I'm taking a group to Cuba. There's a France trip coming up the next fall. People can start to uh, ask about that. We'll spend a couple of days in Paris. We'll spend some days in the countryside. We're going to go to the Roman uh, sites, uh, including Nîmes, which was the uh, the model for Jefferson's capital at Richmond. Uh, and we're going to spend a day on the Canal de Midi, uh, the great uh, Renaissance canal that Jefferson spent nine days on. And so that trip is coming up in the fall of 2022. Also, David, in the spring of 2022, John Steinbeck trip in, in California. So lots and lots going on, plus online courses. My book is out. I'm getting wonderful feedback on that. People who want the book can write to me, and I'll arrange to get them an autographed copy, but you can also get it from all the usual places, including, if you're willing, Amazon or Kindle if you want to read the ebook. And I'm working on an electronic version, but that is slow, slow going. So lots and lots and lots going on, David, but you may never see me again because I'm going out on this crazy trip. Uh, and and something always happens, and so this could I, I might indeed wind up at the bottom of the river. Well, I'm sure you can zoom me from there. With that, sir, shall we go to the show? We shall, but let me just say again, uh, we send out our warmest regards to David McCullough, one of the great historians of our time, um, and we wish him a speedy recovery from um, his own um, health challenges. And we also thank, really from the depths of, of, of human gratitude, uh, Joseph Ellis, the returning champion on the Thomas Jefferson Hour. So let's let's listen to the program. Good day, citizens, and welcome to the Thomas Jefferson Hour, your weekly conversation with or about President Thomas Jefferson. I'm your host, David Swenson, joined this week by the creator of the Thomas Jefferson Hour, the award-winning humanities scholar and author, Mr. Clay Jenkinson, and also very pleased to welcome back Professor Joseph Ellis, good to talk to you, Joe. It's been a while since we have talked with you. In fact, the last conversation we had with you was on our annual 4th of July show about three weeks ago when you and Clay helped confuse listeners about whether it was <laughs> July 2nd or July 4th. 
that we should celebrate? I, I'm still in the same place. I've been for a year and a half now in the Green Mountains of Vermont. Gorgeous country up here. But like everybody else, uh, I'm quarantined. And so the opportunity to try to talk to people like you and the audience of Jefferson Hour is a is really wonderful opportunity. But I do understand that you hosted a gathering at your home on the 4th of July. We did. We did. About 30 people. Uh, they're all people that have sort of left and come up here to the mountains after the pandemic types in New York, Boston and stuff. And um, I'm afraid my dog's in the background there, but... Um, Good to hear him. What I had him do is to say, let's... I, I would like us to say the American prayer together. And so I began, we hold these truths to be self-evident. And then they repeated it and we recited the magic words of American history. And um, we're living in a moment when we all need to listen to those words, I think. Well, back to this show on the second or fourth that I, I enjoyed that conversation between you and Clay as much as anything I've ever I've ever heard on the Jefferson Hour. I thought it was great, and we did get a lot of email about it. I thought perhaps we could uh, answer a few of those questions if it's all right with the both I of you. I stand ready to. Uh, I hope we didn't confuse anyone. I think this is mock confusion. I believe you're correct. The first one comes from Kevin Ryan, who wrote to us with the subject heading "Happy Adams Day." <laughs> <laughs> And wrote, following on from this week's podcast, I thought I should take the opportunity to celebrate with you the anniversary of the passing of the Declaration of Independence by the Continental Congress. Then we got one from Robert Happersett, who writes, I thought I heard Joe Ellis say that the committee to write the Declaration of Independence edited 20 percent of the document, but did not touch the second paragraph and especially the sacred 35 words. But as I learned from Walter Isaacson in his book, Ben Franklin and American Life, Franklin made a critical and profound edit. I could continue with this, or maybe the two of you want to just fill it in. Let me let me uh, respond to I either misspoke or the reader didn't hear me correctly. The draft committee itself, the committee of five, made one change, just as the uh, respondent is saying. It's probably Franklin, although it's not clear the changes made in Jefferson's hand in the original version in the Library of Congress. Jefferson wrote, we hold these truths to be... Sacred and undeniable. And somebody suggested, probably Franklin, he changed that to self-evident, and he regarded that as as not a defacement, but an improvement. That's the only thing they changed. But the whole Congress, when they went into a committee of the whole on uh, the uh, 2nd and 3rd of July did change 20% of the text. They made 138 changes, deletions, but they never touched the magic words. I think that the bulk of the members at the time thought that was just a kind of rhetorical overture, and they thought that the indictment of the king was the real stuff, but uh, they didn't change anything in the words that we think are the most important ones. My sense of it, Joe, is that, and I don't mean any irreverence about this, but as they read through the document, they thought uh, the famous preamble, the 35 magic words, they thought yada, 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 yada. And then they get yeah. to the bulk of it, which is the argument against Great Britain, the parliament right. and the king, that, that the rest yeah, was sort of boilerplate. From, a, from, a, from their point of view at the moment, What they're making a decision to do is to break with Britain, and that means they must denounce and repudiate George III. And therefore, from a a lawyer's point of view, that's the case they're making, and that's what they were paying attention to. But it was probably, um, this is just uh, fluff here, and let's get on with the indictment. But I do think that their sense was, yeah, this is the kind of stuff you have to say at the beginning, but 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 here's the argument of the Declaration of Independence. It's a, it's almost a medieval um, Thomist syllogism. Under certain conditions, a people have a right to rise up and overthrow their government. Those conditions have been met. Therefore, we have no choice now but to rise up and overthrow the colonial government. It's 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 a le- it's an argument in, in logic and it's an argument in in legal. Uh, terms and it's a, and it's an appeal to the world that we're not just a bunch of hotheads here. We have put up with abuse and uh, tyranny, uh, and it, it, you know we've always wanted to assume that these are one-offs or that we can fix this or this is maybe inadvertent or they don't know what they're doing or we can fix this. And now we see 
as Jefferson put it, that there is a long train of abuses and usurpations pursuing invariably the same object, which is to reduce us under an absolute tyranny. So Jefferson's making an argument, and to prove this, that they have the Brit the British ministry and the king have and parliament have so misbehaved that they have forced us, compelled us to revolution, then he says, let the facts be submitted to a candid world. And then what follows is the set of indictments. You know, they've quartered troops in our houses without our consent or recompense. They've taken us across the ocean to be tried in star chambers. They've stirred up uh, the, our slaves to attack us. They've, 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 uh, they've stirred up the Indians of the American West to attack frontier villages, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I, I agree. There's a, the, the most famous words are the ones they didn't pay any attention to. Perhaps the most forgotten words in the Declaration come uh, right before that, when Jefferson says, uh, prudence dictates that governments long established ought not be changed for light and transient causes. And what he's referring to is the last year and a half in which there's really a war going on. Bunker Hill has happened a year earlier, and... The colonists have resisted going to declaring independence. They've been very prudent in their their behavior, and um, and uh, and it, it's really in you know I'm I've written a book recently that's going to come out in September that I call it the Prudent Revolution, and that's somewhat of a contradiction in terms, but um, uh, they're being forced into this. They believe. The person, they don't, they don't really have to declare independence of George III in some sense because they think and say he's already declared his independence of us. By waging war against us. Yeah, it, one of the towns in Maine has already been burned to the ground by British uh, ships uh, and uh, there's atrocities and the bloodiest battle in the war has been fought at Bunker Hill. So if you contextualize that situation... He is saying we have been extremely prudent and patient, and now we have no resort. And the last link holding us to the empire, we've denounced parliament, but till now we have not denounced the king, George III, and here it comes. And the king, um, Jefferson adds a little disingenuously, has vetoed all of our noble attempts to outlaw slavery or at least restrain the yeah. practice. Right. There's... I, I, we might be repeating things we said last on the fourth, but the that paragraph that is deleted is one of the most confusing and syntactically convoluted uh, paragraphs that Jefferson ever wrote. Because I think this is me now, not uh, Jefferson. I think what he was saying, or he was trying to, he was trying to pin both the slave trade and slavery on George the third. And he could do slave trade, sort of, but he couldn't do slavery easily. And doing slavery raises questions that made people nervous anyway. But if you think about it, if he had gotten away with it and had been clear about what he was doing and had put it in there, we would have had in the founding document, whether it's true or not is irrelevant. If what, Once we do it, we are making a clear declaration that slavery is incompatible with the values on which we are establishing this republic. That would have been a big deal, but they deleted it. Yes, and I think that you have exactly articulated Jefferson's purposes. He knew that he was on relatively thin ground, even on the question of the British veto of restrictions on the slave trade, but he right. knew that he was on extremely thin ground and implying somehow that George the third and, and the British were responsible for foisting slavery on the new world. But he, he did not want this amazing manifesto of human freedom to exist without paying attention to the fact that we had slaves and that, and, and we were uncomfortable with it. And we knew we couldn't just brazen it out that this was going to be the, this was going to be a central issue of American life and that we had better get in our, at least our verbal intentions, our idealistic notion that this thing has to be addressed 
right from the beginning. And if we don't, we lay ourselves open to the charge, say, of Samuel Johnson. Isn't it interesting that we hear the loudest yelps for liberty from the drivers of Negroes? Gentlemen, we need to take a break in just a moment. But I did want to touch on one other item from Robert Happersett's letter. And he's quoting Walter Isaacson's book and talks about by using the word sacred, Jefferson had asserted intentionally or not was an assertion of religion. Franklin's edit turned it instead into an assertion of rationality. And I thought that was pretty good. He's right. He's absolutely right. I think that Jefferson was using sacred in a, in a secular sense, uh, but, but perfectly happy for people to take it in a, in a, in a religious sense. The original rough draft supposedly has uh, Franklin's characteristic block lines crossing those out and replacing it in his own handwriting. I've seen the document. I don't think it's as clear that it's Franklin's line or Franklin's handwriting, Um, but I think it is Franklin's idea, and he should get credit for it. Well, Franklin's idea is, is, is a brilliant insight. You know, so instead of saying sacred or or undeniable, some kind of, we really feel strongly about this. Franklin was saying, it's as obvious as two plus two equals four. There are certain self-evident truths in this world, that the sun comes up every day, that the earth travels around the sun, that there is a moon surrounding the earth at about a quarter of a million miles away, that six plus six is 12. These are self-evident truths. And here's another one, that all men are born or created equal. And so I think Franklin nailed it and gave the, he strengthened the document enormously with that one suggestion, if it's his. We're going to take a short break, but we'll be back in just a moment. You're listening to The Thomas Jefferson Hour. Welcome back to The Thomas Jefferson Hour, your weekly conversation with or about President Thomas Jefferson. This week, we are joined by the creator of the Thomas Jefferson Hour, Mr. Clay Jenkinson, and the author, Professor Joseph Ellis. And we were talking about those 35 words. And Clay, you had a follow-up, I think. Well, you know, Joe, you brought up Jefferson's statement that, you know, we don't, shouldn't ever do this for, quote, light and transient causes. In other words, if there's an incident where uh, some troop fires on somebody in a crowd, or if there's a, a tariff that turns out to be wrongheaded, but it uh, doesn't indicate any deeper uh, attempt, intention to enslave us in the American colonies, he says those things we had better bear with. We had better be patient in the face of that, and, and we'll be able to negotiate that. But if there's a pattern that is unmistakable and undeniable and that it all adds up to tyrannizing us or oppressing us, then you can no longer chalk these up as one-offs. You have to, at some point, say these are not uh, in accord with the rights of Englishmen and therefore we are acting. So here's my question for you, Joe. The people of, of January 6th, 2021, who attacked the U.S. Capitol, undoubtedly think of themselves as uh, rebels in the manner of the Minutemen uh, and the Patriots of 1776. So how do we know when it's a light and transient cause? How do we know when it's actual tyranny? Because they thought they were preventing tyranny in America. And I think you would say it was more like the Beer Hall Putsch. Yeah, I I would say something like that. Um, I think that in America, the revolution is led by a political elite, Jefferson among them, who are not radicals. They're conservative revolutionaries. And the kind of leadership that the January 6th group had, the people who were the most uh, ardent and people who committed crimes that were now been pro- being prosecuted, represent the downside of democracy from Jefferson's point of view and from Adam, especially Adams, um, that... Um, that, they, that those are mobs. And to the extent that you want to lead a successful revolution, you need to be under the, the control and under the guidance of values, which I'm afraid the January 6th group were not. Uh, and especially since they're overthrowing a principle established by Thomas Jefferson himself uh, and at John Adams in 1800, which is the legitimate the transfer of power from one party to the other. That happened in 1800, and the January 6th group was essentially 
repudiating that extraordinary important historic precedent. But Jefferson, I think, would want the leaders of the rebels of January 6th to lay out their 18-point argument. What? So what are... <laughs> What are the what is the long train of abuses and usurpations which justifies this action? And I would be, and I don't mean this to be snarky or irreverent or uh, ironic. I would very much like to see their list of indictments, because we get it that they thought that the election was stolen, uh, and that they felt that they had to intervene to pressure the Congress to avoid certifying the election on that day. But I'd like to see the list because. Jefferson, I think, is on to a very important point in revolutionary theory here, Joe, that uh, this is not about hotheads. This is about weighing the situation over time and trying to discern pattern and trying to figure out. And I think Jefferson you know, is the kind of person who said, and we know he did, nobody wishes more than I to work these things out. We're, we're good Englishmen. We're, you know, we, 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 would, we would love to reconcile. Unfortunately, it's no longer possible. So I think this is a really key factor in in the history of revolutions. And I think the American people need to be aware that you, you can't just object to something and then take up arms. You, ha- you have to be able to lay out an argument that will pass muster in international relations and international law. I completely concur. And then I'll do my requisite caveat that Jefferson himself, when it comes to the French Revolution, and he's there just as it was beginning and leaves before it reaches its terror phase. But he's, remember, he does trust in the people in a way that many of the other founders, especially people like Adams, Washington, Hamilton, uh, did not. And he really doesn't fathom when the French Revolution starts that it's going to produce the kind of blood and guillotine deaths that it does. And so he applies a different standard in France than he really does as a revolutionary in America. But they're in diff- they're, those are different revolutionary situations. But he's willing, you know, he's, he doesn't want to hear criticisms of the French Revolution, um, which I think are criticisms that you would be make, you made about, say, the January 6th group. I think we should move on, but just one more um, statement about this. You know, the Jefferson's view of the French Revolution was that the magna, you know, he, he was blindsided by how mighty and violent it became and, and the reign of terror and so on, that he, he assumed over and over again that it would somehow end in, in a benign republic. And, and he later in his life had to go back into his correspondence and make a few adjustments to make it less embarrassing to the historians who would follow. So we know that Jefferson got it wrong and he admitted to John Adams that he got it wrong. But even so, I think Jefferson would say that the magnitude of the French Revolution was in direct measure to the centuries, even millennia of oppression. In other words, that famous letter that he wrote to Lafayette saying, did you expect to be transported from despotism to liberty on a feather bed? Uh, that what, the French Revolution had to be bloodier because there was more at stake and the abuses had been there forever and the institutions had to be torn down. Whereas in America, we, we, we were pretty lightly rooted with gigantic amounts of open space and a very recent history. And so we didn't require that level of magnitude. Agree, but he doesn't figure that out until it happens. Well, he's blindsided. And of course, here's where, here's where your man Adams is like, I was right. I was right. I was right, Mr. Jefferson. (laughs) He can be frustrating in that way because most of the time he is right. Poor Mr. Adams. Poor Mr. Adams. Oh, come on. You know, he's he's always like picking a fight with Jefferson. Uh, We've been talking about those 35 words in the earlier segment. And I just have to ask, knowing the both of you, I'll bet you both recited them for a crowd or a gathering on, on the 4th. Am I right? I did. I did too. What were the circumstances? Everyone rolled their eyes in mine. It was, my circumstance was a group of 30 people gathered at the top of one of the green mountains and uh, people that don't know each other that well. But um, And I was saying that the one thing that I hope we have all in common is a belief in the value of these words, and they all seem to nod yes. Well, they have well, to. That's, well, that's something. You're the, you're the great Joe Ellis. What are they supposed to say? Boy, your cynicism is just popping up. No, it's, you know, the, I was there. I was, I was at a grill. I was turning my bratwurst, and I, and, I, and, I, and, and I said, you know, folks, this is a really important day, and if you, with your with your indulgence, I should like to recite the first words of the immortal Declaration of Independence. And uh, I said, "Here, hold my beer," and maybe that was the problem. You know that that I had already compromised right. myself. 
All right, let's move on. This is a letter that comes from Dustin Gish, who is a faculty member uh, at the Honors College, University of Houston. He's also the author of Thomas Jefferson and the Science of Republican Government, a political biography of notes on the state of Virginia. Sounds like an interesting work. Um, And normally when I go through these letters and prep them for the show, uh, if there are compliments at the top of the letter, I just kind of edit them out. I don't want to seem too self-serving. This one I'm going to read. Thank you, gentlemen, for all your work in bringing Mr. Jefferson back to life through his own words or your discussions. Thanks also to your excellent intellectual companion, Joe Ellis, whose contributions in tandem with Clay's have formed a pair of wings together, which enables the show to soar to even new heights. Wow. Obviously a very smart man. (laughs) Uh, He has a fun letter. He says, let me offer two remarks regarding the question of whether the second or the fourth is the correct date for recalling our National Declaration of Independence, I would call your attention to a phrase that I think perfectly captures the answer to the question. It is a final conclusion to the question from the film, The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance. The line is this, when the legend becomes fact, print the legend. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, um, Well, I agree, and that works if you're a movie but i don't think it should work in attempted uh, historical truth um yeah i think it's a bit tongue-in-cheek joe he is being tongue-in-cheek yeah, to yeah. be sure and second regarding joe's speculation near the end of the episode about what adams might envision as the reputation and legacy of jefferson compared to his own no need to speculate on this one. Adams admitted as much in playfully remarking on the issue adams wrote to jefferson Quote, your character in history may be easily foreseen. Your administration will be quoted by philosophers as a model of profound wisdom, by politicians as weak, superficial, and short-sighted. Mine, like Pope's women, will have no character at all. There we go. (laughs) There we go again. You see, this is so typical of Adam. So look at the insult that he leveled at Jefferson. You, you will be remembered as this great liberty-loving philosopher king, except the people who really know something will remember your administration as weak, <laughs> superficial, and short-sighted. But and then he has, to do, he has to bring himself down. He has to be self-deprecating to prevent that from seeming like too great an insult to Jefferson. And then he quotes Alexander Pope that he, he will have no character at all like women. That's a, that's a typical form of passive-aggressive meanness from John Adams. Uh, that's what he does in the, I mean, I don't mean this to be a cheap shot in his, in the correspondence with Jefferson, every three or four letters, Adams tosses a little cannonball over Jefferson's bow um, and, and says something that could be construed as pretty aggressive and, and, and critical. Um, and then either Jefferson ignores it and goes back to the weather or to the classics or to gardens or to wine or whatever he wants to go back to, or Adams then says a self-depreciating thing to take the sting off of it. Is, is that fair, Joe? I think it is. And you know me, I'm an Adams guy in many respects. There is the line that endorses that view from Adams itself. It says, he remember he said, you know, the history of the American Revolution will never be known. <laughs> but the truth will seem to be that Benjamin Franklin's electrical rod smote the earth and up popped George Washington. And from that point forward, those two conducted all business and transactions themselves. He doesn't mention Jefferson there. Um, what he what is getting at his guff in the questions that you're talking about is the significance that is being given to the Declaration itself, and which uh, and, and and as the author of that document. Jefferson's own reputation is ascending. This is in the 1820s. And, um, and Adams really doesn't think that, that the Declaration itself is that important, um, or is as important. It's so, sort of the thunder that comes after the lightning's already struck when they've already voted for independence. Um, and so, but that is in keeping with Adams's temperament. Um, nevertheless, Let's face it, the world that we inhabit now 
And there's not a Jeffersonian world. It's not rural. It's not a place where a small government can work very well. And so, I mean, I guess the person we normally think of is Hamilton, whose, whose vision of an industrial America is is uh, is the one that came to be true. But Adams was comfortable with that too. So in some sense, neither Adams' view or Jefferson's view is going to end up dominating the future. I agree with that. My only point about this is that, uh, first of all, let me say that if Adams had written the Declaration of Independence, I think he would have said the same thing. I think he would have said that was just the legal announcement, that was the news release, that the actual business was the 2nd of July. I don't think he would have been a vain author making big claims for his Declaration of Independence. I think this was an honest argument about the primacy of the of the passage of the resolution on the 2nd of July. But, but I will say this about the correspondence. You tell me if I'm wrong, Joe, that in all of that correspondence, Jefferson never says a mean thing ever or an insult to John Adams. In fact, he goes out of his way he says, well, yeah. we disagree, but we disagree as rational friends, or you, perhaps you had better information than I did, or time has made this seem less interesting than it once was. But he never, under any circumstances, throws an insult at John Adams, and Adams seems to need to and want to throw some at his old pal in Virginia. True enough. I mean, I, you know, the image I've depicted in books I've written is Jefferson standing up straight with his arms folded, and Adams is pacing back and forth in front of him, and uh, yelling at him and pulling on his his uh, lapels, um, but for Adams, the best kind of dialogue is an argument, <laughs> and for Jefferson, argument is dissonant noise, um, and he wants this friendship to go down in history. He knows he's writing these letters to us as well as to, to Adams, and that so he's maintaining this posture of uh, our, of the of the friendship. And Adams wrote two letters for every one of Jefferson. At least. Yeah, yeah. The, the remember, correspondence I mean, was more important to Adams. And Jefferson had other things to do. He, like, found the University of Virginia. Yes, that's all true. But, you know, but I don't go with the um, your, your metaphor, your simile, your trope. Mine is that... Jefferson is on the ropes like Muhammad Ali, and he's doing rope a dope, and and Adams is just like punching and. I I see it. I'm not. I, I don't. Yeah, I, I think there's some of that's true, and certainly on the French Revolution, it's true. But um, I think that I keep coming back to the fact that these the North and South poles of the American Revolution, and that the fact that they're able to talk to each other, and that they're in some sense the revolution itself is not complete until they're together, until that argument is occurring. I think they sense Finally, that. I would also just say that if Adams did write the Declaration, it wouldn't have the magic words in them. No, I agree with that. But I think that, to go back to your, to your bigger point, I think that at some point when the correspondence had found its, its stride, sometime around 1814 and on, so that gave them another 12 years, I think they both realized two things. First of all, um, we're only ostensibly writing to each other here. We're really writing over each other's heads to the to the verdict of of history. And I that's that's the easier point. the The more interesting point, I think, is that they both realized that they were trying to create a synthesis of the meaning of the American Revolution. That this was not just correspondence. That this was an important act of political um, interpretation to try to to establish a narrative that they could agree upon about the meaning of the revolution. And I think they largely did come to agree. I think they did in the end too, which is a very uplifting sign and uh, for us perhaps, but, uh, but that um, friendship can overcome political differences um, and love can take their place of political partisanship. But if they had both had the same temperament, Jefferson's equanimity and stoicism and evasion of argument, if they had both been that character, or if they'd both been pugnacious and wanting to have it out, the correspondence couldn't have occurred. That it required the fact that they had two very different ways of doing this. If Jefferson had struck back with kind of equal aggression, the friendship and the correspondence might have died. If Adams had just said, there's nothing at stake here, let's just talk about the weather, I don't think the correspondence would have survived for 14 years. I agree, but we're familiar with the doctrine of checks and balances as a principle in the Constitution, but in 
the correspondence, you see checks and balances working out temperamentally as well as ideologically in their correspondence. Thank God we had both of them. And then you remember, like, Adams keeps saying, checks and balances, Mr. Jefferson, checks and balances. And Jefferson is like, I get it, I get it. I agree. And, you know, I, as far as uh, Adams and his argumentative nature, we all know people that believe the only way you're really communicating is if you argue. But if, if Joe well, said to me in, in, on the air today or in correspondence, I can tell you what your reputation is going to be. Um, to the great unwashed, you'll be regarded as a profound intellect and wit, but to anyone who's serious, you'll be seen as weak, <laughs> short-sighted, and superficial. That would be the end of the conversation. I mean, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna swallow that the way Jefferson did. And that's a pretty, that's a pretty strong thing to say. Well, I think that's part of the magic of their relationship and why we're so fascinated with it centuries later. We need to take a short break. When we come back, I have an email from a gentleman in Bath. So with that gentleman, we shall take a short break, but we will be back in just a moment. You're listening to The Thomas Jefferson Hour. Welcome back to this very special edition of The Thomas Jefferson Hour. And I can, you know, I can tell the difference between Joe Ellis and me in a nutshell. Joe Ellis is at an undisclosed location, undoubtedly a gated community in the Green Mountains of Vermont. I'm in a single wide in North Dakota. Joe has That's said, not true. Joe has said, <laughs> Joe has said at least three times in this one hour in my most recent book, or in a book that I wrote back in 1994, and some of the books yeah. that I wrote during, you know, and I and, and so Joe is like, you know, we, we call him the returning champion for a reason. Joe is eminent. I am I am that guy who gets to hang around with Joe Ellis. So we, <laughs> oh, we all get we this. We all are. We all are. And, and so we we all get this. Give me a break, all, guys. This, this is like the Jerry Lewis movie when he's in the boxing ring and he's and he and he's doing little rabbit punches until the guy finally just levels him. So we get it, Joe. You know, we, we know that yet another book is coming, rolling off the pen of Joe Ellis. <laughs> And, that it'll- and, and, and 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 we're going to revisit that probably in this episode, but let me rescue you, Clay, before you dig that hole any deeper, may I? Yes, of course. We received a, a response from Ryan Baxter. He wrote us the first time in May. He's from Bath, England, and he wrote asking about Jefferson's courtship with Martha because he had recently become engaged. Do you recall this, gentlemen? Yes, uh, from Bath in England, Bath. Bolf. Yeah, there you go. And he wrote us back. He said, after hearing your answers, uh, he wanted to thank you, gentlemen, for responding to his question and added, yes, Clay, I did note your teasing pronunciation of the fair city of Bath. Surely a man of Oxford should be beyond that. <laughs> <laughs> I've been to Bath a number of times and I love it. And I'll tell you, I want to say to him that I would love to come there sometime because I'm, I'm Joe, I'm fascinated by the explorer, Sir Richard Francis Burton. He was one of the people searching for the source of the Nile, and he and and a man named Speak, John Speak, uh, were searching for it, and it was actually Speak who bumbled into it at, at Victoria, Lake Victoria, and at the time, Burton was on, on, on uh, recovering from a very, very severe illness, and so then this created one of the great controversies of the 19th century because Burton was uh, a genius, uh, although a strange one, and Speak was just sort of a, an English guy, a hunter, and, and Burton spoke 29 languages and Speak barely spoke beyond English. And so then there was going to be this debate. They were going to have it out in Bath, uh, and there were all the worthies, including Livingston, were there. This was going to be a debate about whether the source of the Nile was yet to be found or whether it was Victoria or whether it was Tanganyika. And uh, just before the debate was to occur, and I would just I just would love to recreate this. Uh, a message was handed up to to Livingston, uh, who was the moderator, and it said that Speak had died of a gunshot wound while hunting nearby, um, and he had been his his shotgun had discharged and killed him. And the crowd immediately believed that Burton had driven him to suicide. Which is not true, almost certainly not true. Well, certainly not true with respect to Burton, but also probably not true with respect to how Speak died. But this was this was a um, a gigantic culture wide controversy, and it became a talked about question for for years and decades. 
And I'm just so fascinated by that moment. I would love to find a way to recreate that day, the Speak Burton debate in Both. And so I'm not um, I'm not making fun of the of the pronunciation of of, of Both whatsoever. <laughs> so it's Both I'm, rather than Bath. The British say Both. We we say Bath, and when we do, the British kind of cringe. But then if I say Both, then our friend there thinks I'm being um, irreverent. He says he understands that both Jefferson and Adams had visited that city. Yes. My understanding is that whilst the two men did not much enjoy their trip, Abigail Adams was a big fan. Their visit would have been around the time that the city was at the height of its Georgian pomp and attracted the fashionable and wealthy from across Europe. I can see why the two gentlemen from Massachusetts and Virginia Farms did not take to it. Jefferson liked it. And then he says, I can confirm that I am a Brit with an interest in American history rather than an exile from your land, a fascination sparked by a single course at university and which only seems to grow as the years pass. And he closes saying, in feeding this love of American history, I've recently rewatched the fantastic HBO series, John Adams. I would be keen to hear your thoughts on this show and especially its portrayal of Jefferson and Adams. Are these men represented fairly and accurately, or is there anything you take issue with? I'll yield to Joe on this. I think that the John Adams miniseries is absolutely first rate and brilliant, and that even though Jefferson is a little bit too eccentric in it for my taste, I think uh, the, the creators nailed John Adams and got him exactly right. I tend to agree. Uh, the advisor there was David McCulloch, and he had just finished a book on Adams, and so he was brimming over with stuff. And the script for that show, almost a third of the script is directly from Adams's or Jefferson's correspondence and things they actually said, They're sometimes used in different places. But um, with regard to their place, and when Adams and Jefferson were traveling in England together, they got into a, a habit of reinforcing one another to say that British gardens and British traditions and British senses of excellence were inferior to American. They're both in an anto-Anglo posture. And remember <laughs> that we just finished a war with this country, and there's some reason for that. Well, Adams presented Jefferson to His Majesty George III at a levy. And according to Jefferson, um, George III turned his back on Adams and Jefferson as a way of showing his distaste for these these upstart American rebels. Jefferson may have been overreading that situation. Yeah, people don't agree about whether that's true, though my take is that by sending Adams to be the first minister to the court of St. James in England, it's as if they, the Protestants sent Luther to be their representative at the Vatican. <laughs> And I mean, you know, this was the guy that made the war happen and uh, helped to do that. And they regard and they just silenced him throughout the time that he was there. I love Both. And if you read Jane Austen, it is such a major location in her novels. And the, the thought of Jefferson and Adams there uh, strikes me as delightful. And I think that Jefferson and I think Adams felt this, too. They were they were Anglophiles, though they didn't like to admit it. Uh, but Jefferson was offended by the artificiality of the British class system. And Bath at that time would have been more mannered than it has ever been before or ever been since. And so I think Jefferson probably felt a certain distaste for the the uh, ostentation of, of, of British high-class manners at a place like Bath. But But they loved the British countryside, and Jefferson took... Uh, huge folio garden books with him and a pencil, and he annotated those books by actually seeing the gardens, and he dragged poor Adams along to these gardens. Adams was less interested than Jefferson. And then when they went into sites of the English Civil War, uh, Adams got into like verbal disputes with the local people in the pub and said, you don't, you don't know what, what was fought here. You should, you should be prouder of the great tradition of the British. And, and did, uh, right? Didn't he, Joe? He was like holding forth and saying, 
You you should know more about your I've own history. I've forgotten that. Yeah, but you're right. Yes. And Jefferson was undoubtedly looking down into his sherry at that point. I want to thank Mr. Baxter, Ryan Baxter, for keeping in touch with us. I hope we hear from you again, sir. I hope we keep keep in touch. And I'm going to I'm going to Britain in, on on Halloween, and my daughter and I. Uh, we'll we'll try to run him down. I have to say that I thought about this letter and I I dialed up HBO and I watched an episode, the one titled Independence from the John Adams series, and it's great. It really is. I'm glad to hear that the both of you support it from a historical perspective. Um, there, there's so much every time you watch that 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 you learn, and it just reminded me of what an incredible story this is. Well, may I just say something quickly, David, about this? So I've no, I've met David McCullough. I'm a I'm a great admirer of his work. Um, you know, he set out to write a dual biography of Jefferson and Adams, and he found Adams so much more interesting and and, and more authentic than Jefferson that the book became. Uh, almost exclusively about Adams, and he's written uh, some great books about Theodore Roosevelt, uh, the Panama Canal, the Wright brothers. I mean, he's he's a, the very epitome of an American public intellectual. But here's but here's the point I want to make. Mr. Dr. Joseph Ellis is an academic, and his uh, academics will sometimes quibble with David McCullough because partly because he's not one of them. But they also will quibble. But they can't quibble with Joe Ellis because Joe Ellis can can ring the bell in both camps. The academics, uh, wh- however grudgingly, have to say first rate, and the public can read his books. And that is almost never the case with books by major academics, is it, Joe? Well, I never learned how to write academies, I guess. that's my, I was bad in foreign languages. I just want to use this opportunity to s- salute David McCullough. My impression is David is not well right now, and um, he has made a significant contribution to the understanding of American history uh, and the books he's written has this huge audience. And, Absolutely. Uh, he's, a, he's a great gentleman. Think of, think of Ken Burns' Civil War without David McCullough as the narrator. That's right. That's right. I wanted to add that. I think he's, along with his, his uh, prowess at writing books, he's an incredible narrator. Um, he understands that uh, he understands storytelling, and and that is a rare, rare talent. I think, I, you know. But and the other thing about the, I thought Stephen Delane did an admirable job at portraying Jefferson. I mean, can you imagine how difficult uh, that role? Yeah, there's no way to know if you get it right. You have to sort of, and and uh, Tom Wilkinson as Benjamin Franklin. Um, yeah, just the the casting and the character building in that was is really good. I, I so I I will probably go back and watch the whole thing again. Uh, the Jefferson portrayal I think is right. Jefferson is eccentric, bordering on Aspergers. There's he there's a lot of interiority in Jefferson and a lot of evasion. Um, and this is something I learned from Joseph Ellis that Jefferson lived in a kind of an interior space that was safely agrarian in sort of the Horatian and Virgilian sense, and that the, that was the rap on him by people like Adams and Hamilton, that Jefferson was obviously a beautiful, marvelous visionary, and people respected and, 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 and deeply admired it, but they also thought, yeah, we have to live in the real world too, Mr. Jefferson. I thought what was really good about his portrayal is that you miss it. Um, within within the show, I mean, you, the, it's these little things that he does. You know, they're they're in this uh, in this room, and Franklin has just changed his 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 lines on the thirty five words. You can just see how awkward and difficult this is for Jefferson. But then the conversation ends with Franklin complimenting him on this swivel chair, and Jefferson lights up because it's one of his inventions. And there's another scene where he's dealing with all the the delegates, and he comes up in the midst of a conversation, says a few odd things, and leaves, and everybody kind of looks at each other like, who was that guy? <laughs> the guy who played Jefferson, it, it's, it's, you have to know a lot about Jefferson to realize how good he is at what he's doing. There's a scene in that in that uh, miniseries that I've always remember that it's the scene where Adams is introduced to George the Third, and there's an exchange between them. And apparently, the guy who plays George the Third, who's a British actor, I don't remember his name, ad libbed it, and it's a knockout scene. And they they used the strict language 
that from Jefferson from Adams's memoirs that George the Third says that Adams is a man who holds his own country as his highest priority, and that he, and he George the Third thinks that that's absolutely appropriate. Let me sneak in one more letter before we run out of time. This one's from Dominic Frederick. And he asks, were the original articles of confederation based on the ancient Greek city-states? No. No. (laughs) Okay, that's that's easy. The original articles of confederation essentially adopt the model of the, well, they're not based on any Grecian or Greek or Roman principle. To some extent, they're based on the state governments or the colonial they're not really intended to be a government. They're, it's sort of like a League of Nations. It's an alliance. And instead of a division among executive, uh, legislative, and judicial power, which most of the state governments are, it's a single Congress with a powerless executive and no judiciary. And um, it, it's really not intended to be a government. It's intended, as I'm saying, to be a very loose confederation of states which are respectively sovereign. Okay, and he also asks uh, if if Dr. Ellis would discuss his book, After the Revolution, Profiles of Early American Culture. I wrote that a long time ago, Uh, so uh, he might remember it almost better than I do, but it's a study of um, several writers, painters, and dramatists in the wake of the revolution, so that's the title, After the Revolution, and the way in which the revolution dictates the themes that the artists and the thespians are are featuring. And um, uh, it's, I think, one of my first efforts after my dissertation. And so... Well, I'm glad he asked about it because I was unaware of it, and now I have something to look for. Um, and then lastly, before we say goodbye for the week, you have a new book coming out uh, soon, The Cause, Joe. Do you want to share anything about that? I do. It's 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 a book called The Cause, The American Revolution and Its Discontents. I didn't know what I was doing. That's a very familiar thing for me at the start of 40 years ago when I started writing about the late 18th century. But it turns out I was writing a history of the American founding, but I was doing it backwards. <laughs> and th- this is a book about the first founding, the 1770s, the war for independence, the run-up to that and the implications of that. Um, well, maybe the next time you're on, Joe, we can discuss it in, in more detail. And and then finally, Clay, you've got a new, a new book out, and a bunch of emails have come in asking how people can get it, especially signed copies from you. Uh, yes, a couple of things. So people can get my book from Amazon.com and BarnesandNoble.com. They can ask their local bookstore to, to get it. It's being distributed nationally by Ingram, so you can ask your bookstore to order it for you, and they certainly will. If they want me to sign one, they just need to send me an email uh, through the Jefferson Hour or contact us, and, and then we will work things out. We work on trust, so if somebody... Uh, wants me to sign one, I'll send it, and they and they can just send a check or or a ranch, you know, whatever they want to contribute. But I just want to say I want to get a bell on this program if we're going to continue with Joe. So every time we mention one of his books, that we can just ring a bell because I think I've heard seven today. You know, Joe has written about absolutely everything. They're all first rate. He's won all of the great awards. Um, it, it's amazing. And now the cause, and you have another book in you still, right? You're writing about the lost promise the lost opportunity of race in America. Yeah, that's going to be the next one, Why the Founders Failed to End Slavery. Joe, thank you so much for joining us this week. I'm sorry we're out of time. It seems like we could go on and on and on, but we are out of time for this week. Hey, it's my pleasure, guys. A very special edition of the Thomas Jefferson Hour with our friend, our dear, dear friend, Dr. Joseph Ellis at an undisclosed location in the Green Mountains of Vermont. We'll see you all next week for another exciting edition of the Thomas Jefferson Hour. The Thomas Jefferson Hour is brought to you each week by Dakota Sky Education. The program is distributed nationally by Prairie Public. President Thomas Jefferson lived from 1743 to 1826, and this program presents his views. President Jefferson is portrayed by the award-winning humanities scholar and author Clay S. Jenkinson. To obtain a copy of this or any show for a $12 donation, please call 701-575-0727. 
This program is also available online at jeffersonhour.com and on Apple Podcasts. If you'd like to correspond with President Jefferson or submit a question for him to answer on the program, please visit the website at jeffersonhour.com. The Thomas Jefferson Hour is produced at Makoche Recording Studios in Bismarck, North Dakota. Bach Cello Suite No. 3 in C Major by Stephen Swinford. Thank you for listening. Please tune in again next week for another thought-provoking, historically accurate program, Through the Eyes of Thomas Jefferson. Thank you.